Hey, everyone. Good hey, morning, everybody. George. Hey, good morning, Matt. So excited today. Who great? This is a great topic. One that I am so psyched to get into. Um, before I do that, I want to say uh, thank you so much for uh, normal uh, visitors, guests, viewers, uh, people watching us on YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter now. So uh, just a little bit of who we are. We're Valiant Technology. Uh, we're a managed service provider located in New York. I uh, work with a bunch of variety of customers, but one of our uh, customer specializations is uh, marketing, communications, PR, ad agencies. And um, this is a really close topic to that environment typography now um this is definitely more your ballywick than mine matt uh is you've done work in design and all that and you do all some great balance great website and alphabet serial is one of my favorites so yes, I, I know you're a fan of it uh, it's a crunchy corn um so before we go too deep into it uh let's just talk about the history of typography so let's get let's kind of go in where did it come from why do we have it what does it do it, it, it allows us to communicate with each other. It allows us to have a history of record. It allows um, society to build upon itself to make itself better. And, uh, you know, I think that if we didn't have a few people making cave drawings about 40,000 years ago, things would be very different for us. Right, you know? right. Uh, now, of course, and sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go ahead. This is your, this is, this is important. Uh, you know, cave drawings are amazing, and it's 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 actually cool to see some of the studies that have been done around them, and some of just the photos that have been taken for ones that have been discovered over the years, and their sheer age, and you know the stories that they tell. But you got to wonder how accurate our interpretations of their stories are, right? Because they're they're graphics, they're 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 they're, they're crudely drawn graphics, and it's like yep. I don't know if this was us being attacked by cows, or if we were going and hunting you know, uh, uh, bison, bison. Food or, see, see or, tigers, bully mammoths. or a bunch of people figured out that, you know, fruit can ferment and now they're walking around on all fours again for a little bit. Who knows what it is? We don't. And that's because there was no true standardized system of symbols yep. to allow us to represent our ideas and what we're trying to communicate. And, you know, uh, like I said, it, it's, it is an awesome start. Thank you. Great, 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 great great uncle um but you know now we've got character sets and that makes a big difference and right. you know it's yeah you know pictures do speak a thousand words right but again like i was saying we don't know if they're speaking the right words to us and right. having character sets um takes a lot of ambiguity out of communications and it's allowing us to do exactly what we're doing right now well it also you know i think if you think about using uh fonts or the, this, this these symbols um they allow uh, that information be passed through space and time. You know, we still can read those ancient cuneiform tablets from Mesopotamia where they're complaining about their tax bill or the recipe for making ancient beers. So it's, it's pretty exciting, actually. So pretty cool. How great would it be if all of a sudden we're like looking at something with glyphs that have never been understood and they get interpreted and it just ends up saying death and taxes, but it's like from like 5,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah, seriously. It's literally, but that's a joke of it. There's literally like complaints about like, staff shortages, like kind of the same things we talk about today. It's, so, it's, life. it's life. And no matter where we are in, in history, there are certain challenges that we all have. That's um, right. And that's right. Think, you know, uh, forms of typography have been used for, for many thousands of years. 2,000 years ago is, I think, the earliest um, trace back that makes good sense to us right. from a historic standpoint. And that was the discovery of, um, of punches and dies that were meant for currency. Right. So there you go. You're tying um, typography to another incredibly important part of our um, our existence. I don't yeah. know, our existence. It's money, but you know, it's it's important to society. It's pretty important stuff. And it's and then of course there was the invention of wingdings, and I think that was like 2300 BCE or something yes. like that. Yes, right after papyrus. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> there are origins of Clippy from back then in certain glyphs found on on cave walls. Um, but no, it, it, there's a lot of this great uh, evidence that's been found over the years. I mean, look, um, we were talking this morning about the Mesopotamian cities. Yep, exactly. Right? Brick stamps used for um, creating uh, records. And uh, they were uneven, which was kind of cool because that meant that they were set by hand. Right. And they weren't at a point where um, technology, or at least what we would maybe look at as being technology within context of this conversation came about. Um, but over the next several hundred years, things have changed. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. 
Someone was going to say papyrus. I had to say it first. I had to get it out. I had to get it out of the way. <laughs> so, um, but uh, you know, so there's you know a lot of really cool stuff. There's uh, the Roman lead inscriptions in their pipes. Right. That, um, gosh, they should have said, "Do not drink this." But uh, <laughs> they were made with movable type printing. So that was another right. kind of like step forward. Um, I'm trying to remember some of these dates off the top of my head. These are not the kinds of numbers. It, it was kind of the, kind of the uh, in between BCE and CE. Yeah. Or the and now, um, yeah, we're looking at about 2,500 year range yep. here. Um, in the 11th century in China, they were using type systems that were made of either ceramic or wood. So that was, you know, again, having dyes, unfortunately, ceramic and wood are very malleable substances right. um but then korea is like hey man we got this and they start using different forms of metals and that was right. in like the 1200s or something like that and, and then we have the kind of the, sort of the information age as yeah. we know in the West automation world. automation, automation exactly right. what it was. johannes right. yeah 1439 um right. really kind of taking everything from being fully manual into a somewhat automated state and that's how things like Books right. and anything that has to be printed in mass is is is, is able to happen. If um, you ever have a chance, take a, take a quick peek of what a Gutenberg Bible looked like, which was the first kind of big printing and broadsheets yeah. and information. It's like it's definitely the you know it's definitely the piece that kind of corresponds to that Renaissance in Europe and the change of is the information first information age. So anyway, let's get back to twenty twenty two. All right, what? What's a typeface? What's a font? What does all this stuff mean, Matt? It means absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's it's obviously very important, but they kind of mean the same thing nowadays. Okay. Yeah, um, the term typeface has been used since typesetting became a thing, um, and font is a, is a term that we use a lot nowadays. And while they do mean different things, they've become interchangeable because of how widespread the usage of the word font has become over the years. Right. And if we were to point a finger at something, it would be desktop publishing that caused that because the uh, advent of desktop of publishing and the increase in accessibility to that ability, uh, to that type of work meant that individuals would be adopting whatever terminology was put in front of them because it was so new. That's right. And you know, that's, that's exactly why we hear font so much more than typeface. Typeface, right. And, and it's interesting, like uh, the original, uh, you know, desktop publishing applications were really truly built to emulate the methodologies that you would use in yeah. uh, in physical printing, even though the medium was utterly different in how it operates, you know? It's, and, and I think what's, what's, late, what's cool is later in this uh, episode, we have some really interesting pieces about uh, typesetting that, that, that we still use today that we don't really, um, that you would be like, why do we even use this word? And it's such an interesting thing. Uh, so absolutely tell, and now you're, you're, yeah. you're giving me quark express flesh flashbacks as we're doing oh, this. i remember yes 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 uh, um, you can't see the hands but they're kind of cringing over here a little bit oh yeah um but I mean, there is a difference and the difference is that a, a typeface is a set of glyphs you know glyphs hieroglyphs individual sim symbol is what we're getting right. at here so those are the characters of an alphabet it's your numbers it's your punctuation marks special characters anything that shares a common design um, a font is a particular set of glyphs within a typeface. So there's a little bit of a hierarchy, and that gets ignored these days. And if we look at this quick graphic here, give me one second. This is the Poppins typeface. It has um, I'm echoing. Am I echoing? Who cares? Um, there are five different weights here, light through bold. Each one of those is a font. But collectively, right. they're a typeface. And the letter P, the letter O, the letter G, those are your glyphs. Right. And um, so that's just the quick breakdown on, on a font. And uh, in case you were wondering, we chose font to show here because that's what we consider our corporate typeface to be. This is the one yep. that we use. We chose it back in, what, 2017 or something like that as an alternative to what we've been using. And it's because it's so dang beautiful. I mean, look, it's, it's, it's a beautifully geometric font. The weights are great to work with. Very um, readable. It's, it's it become works. very widespread. I believe LinkedIn's logo uses uh, yeah. Poppins for the in, and um, it was actually designed not too long ago by a gentleman named Johnny Pinhorn and released by the Indian Type Foundry. But it's open source now, 
which means uh, it's freely there to use. It, there's actually a total of like 18 weights or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, which I avoid. I like the flexibility of the five that we use, but don't want to have too many options. Right. And um, gosh, he's a, he's a great designer. I and mean, he also designed the font Carla, which we use in the uh, marketing community that I run with some other people within our industry. So it's good stuff. And I just wanted to highlight that here because um, his work had a huge influence on how we communicate ourselves. Right. So, right. That's cool. so now, George, I'm going to hit you with a challenge because I know that you worked for marketing and communications companies sure. early in your career. So uh, why don't you tell me a little something about the different kinds of families that exist for fonts? You got it. So if you want, so you can really break down fonts into five families, maybe a six family. I'll get to at the end. Um, there is the serif fonts. Uh, they're kind of traditional. They have wings and flares and tips, kind of edges, kind of when we think of like old style printing, that's where we think of uh, serif style fonts. Um, you know, some examples uh, that we want to use is, you know, Times New Roman. I mean, Roman. It's kind of like our kind of yeah. go to sans serif fonts. Um, oh, so serif fonts. Sans serif, uh, trying to take the sans from the French of not. Um, there's no of these extra pieces on the font. Um, what would be a good example of a sans serif font? Helvetica. Helvetica, right. Kind of classic. You, you know what else is a really good example of a sans serif font? What's that? Boom. Poppins. I was going to say, Matt, we throw out the Poppins. So um, it's, a, you know, it's, it's, and generally it's better for reading in digital formats. Um, it's more versatile and it allows uh, smoother communication. Um, next, we have a cursive. It's meant to look like handwriting. Um, that's always a bit of an oddball one. And uh, as, you know, as, as today, as we use some more digital platforms, digital tools, uh, people have less and less ability to read uh, handwritten, kind of like the classic copper plate handwriting is called like that. Um, then there's the fantasy, uh, which I think uh, Drew uh, brought up before with the wingdings. Um, that's uh, that's interesting. Uh, uh, interesting, you know. Fantasy would be more like the uh, the font used for the Blade Runner logo. Oh, Things right. like that. Uh, I got whereas, whereas wingdings is just a set of uh, special characters. Um, and then cursive, just really quickly, is it's always important to mention that I, I don't think anyone should use cursive as actual text for reading. It's meant for flair. It's meant to set a tone. Yes. Maybe anything is like a heading or, or or some kind of embellishment, but you'd never want to put a paragraph of text in front of someone that's in cursive. It's very odd. It's like trying to read. It's like once again, trying to read someone's handwriting, which is always a yeah. bit odd. Um, and the last one is a monospace. That's uh, more like a typeset font. Like you know, if you ever see like type uh, yeah. a typewriter, like old school IBM Selectronic. Yeah, it's ball. also um, it's also probably the preferred type of font for the uh, network administrators. That's what we use in our consoles and terminals because we want everything to line up and be spaced nicely. It's true. They're all very, very organized in that regard. In, in development, in when I'm writing code, I'm using um, either Courier New, which is a yeah. font that's everywhere, or, or one that's called Hack because it's monospace. It's re really easy to read. And when you're writing code and you want to make sure that you have your tabs, or your your spaces, whatever it is that you use for formatting, uh, you want that along with your letter spaces to be consistent so you can actually yep. read the code. And you, you have to be able to see structure visually. And right. that allows you to do that in a way that's consistent. So monospace fonts have a very special place in the hearts of many uh, technically inclined yeah. individuals. Yes, it's your uh, text edit font, if you want to think of it that way to make it easy yes. in your mind. So mm -hmm. that's great. And so, um, all right. So we now we kind of know there's a couple of different fonts. There's a couple of different things. What, what's the, uh, how are fonts built? How are the glyphs actually themselves kind of combined into what they are? Oh, okay. Well, well uh, to first answer your question, how they're built, um, modern fonts are, are, are really vector-based uh, 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 files, they're, they're, they're combinations of numbers that represent where something should, should be on a screen. Um, that's nice because it makes them scalable. They're not dependent on any resolution. And maybe we'll show Fontographer in a future episode. That's something I had tried yeah. working with maybe 20 years ago, had a headache, sure. and then I think I deleted the software from my computer completely. Because <laughs> this it's is an math. art. It's, this is not just the thing you do. It's math. It's like, it's, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But, um, but really kind of getting to, to the heart of your question, um, I think it's more like, what's the anatomy of a font? How are these things? What, what are the components that build up to being whatever it is? Hello, dog. Um, that's there. Um, so let's take a quick look at the word technology. 
And this was actually um, done in a, another popular typeface that's available on almost all computers by default, Georgia. And uh, we chose the word technology because it's part of the company name and it's got enough variation to really kind of jump into what all the little bits and pieces that make up a font are. Um, so whenever we're talking about something for the next few minutes, we're, gonna, we're really going to concentrate on whatever is on the screen that's in orange. Just um, So on the left-hand side, you'll see that there's like this really large bar. And that's what's known as your cap height. That's the measurement of your capital letters within a typeface. And on the opposite side, on the right, you've got your X height. And that's the measurement of all of the lowercase letters in a typeface. And you use those measurements to create consistency. Because when you're, you're building a typeface, you want your eyes to easily ingest the information so that your brain can make sense of it and start putting concepts together, ideas, whatever it is that you're reading. And if your eye doesn't have a standard line to follow, you're not going to ingest that information very well. Um, look at it as the difference between someone with poor handwriting and someone with good handwriting. Right. You know, right. You're going to find that people with better handwriting have tend to have consistency within these kind of like measurements, and they're, they're just so much easier to read. Um, but you know what? That's just measurements. Let's talk about flair. Let's talk about serifs. And if you see that the, the lower right-hand corner of the letter T just lit up, and that's what we're talking about, so I'll just kind of make that blink a little bit. Right there, yep. And that's just the short line added at the uh, beginning and end of a stroke of a font. And that's there for flair. It's also there because it gives our eyes something to anchor onto for the sake of reading. And that's the reason why you'll see people, or even we said it earlier, I believe, that large blocks of text do really well with serif fonts. And it's right. because we have, we're giving our eyes little waypoints and clues of what to look for and where to look next. Uh, serifs don't always apply to everything. And the end stroke of a character that doesn't have a serif is simply known as the terminal. It's the end of the stroke of the character. Um, there's so much more here. Uh, we've got ascenders. I always like saying that word, ascender. It sounds so like sounds, sounds something good's going to happen. Yeah. Dynamic. Yeah. But unfortunately, when it comes to a font, it just means the vertical stroke that extends above the X height that, that's been established. Um, this is a good one, and talking about the anatomy of a font, this is the shoulder. This is a, uh, a stroke that curves out and downwards into another stroke. And right. it looks a lot like a person's shoulder. So it, the naming makes perfect sense. Uh, the next one is one that I've always found interesting, and it's all about the negative space. The counter of a character or glyph is an enclosed space. So it's the, the center of an O, it's the circles that you'll find within the loops of a G. Um, they're an area that I always like to have fun with when doing type treatments. So you'll find that whenever I do something, I'll use a really geometric font because I want those circles to be truly be circular and not oval. Right. Uh, that's something I love playing with. Uh, the next part is the stem, which is just a, a vertical stroke. Nothing more than that. So the T has a stem, the H has a stem, the N has a stem, the L. Those are all stems. Um, let's see. This is cool. This is a very unique uh, part. You might want to think of this as being, I'm trying to equate it to a body part in the human anatomy, and that's not going to go into a good place. So we're just going to go ahead and <laughs> refer to it as the link. link. <laughs> yeah. The link is what uh, is used to connect two different strokes. In the case of a G, it's the bowl and the loop. And this isn't something that you see terribly often. Now, uh, I'm getting redeemed. Is there, is there other that? letters? Is there other letters that have uh, uh, that link like that? Uh, typically, no. But in some typefaces, yes. Uh, you'll see certain ones where the letter Y will have a link that I find right. to be kind of awkwardly placed. To be honest, I think it's more about stylistic decisions than, than the functionality or readability of the font. Right. Um, so we've got that. Now getting back to the whole kind of like trying to figure out a comparison to anatomy, this is the perfect one. This is the ear. If you see that little bit of the G on the, uh, the upper right hand corner of it, I'll get it to kind of go back and forth a little bit so you can see it. Um, it's kind of a useless appendage. It's like the alphabet's appendix. You know, it's just a small stroke that extends out from lowercase g. It's really only used in the lowercase g, and it's not something that we would normally do when we're writing by hand. So again, that's why I consider it to be kind of like a vestigial limb for a font. Um, all right, we're almost done here. We've got the descender, which is the vertical stroke that goes underneath the x height, the opposite of the ascender. 
And then of course there's the arm, which is probably the most literal comparison to human anatomy that can be made. And that is just a portion of a letter that's attached on one end and then free on the other. So right. yeah, it's well, exactly, it's the same thing. It's attached to my body, it's going outwards, it's being extended into the air. Um, you know, and there's, there's all these different bits and pieces to a font that make it, that make it have, per, make it have personality. And, and, and it's something that's attractive to look at. And when you're happy looking at something, you're going to take in the information better. Um, there are all these different factors that we didn't talk about, like kerning and letting and line that's heights. A whole other, that's a whole other episode of, 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 of text layout versus it the is. font itself. And we're going to do that. We're going to do that next week. I'm going to have some fun with it. We're going to do an interactive demo. I think I'm going to have actually you and Megan do the demo and I'll sit back and kind of like let you guys have some fun with it. And we'll talk how things work and where what, what kind of settings are, are ideal for whatever use case we have. It's always going to be different. This is this good. Is hard work. Um, but, but so look, we've gone over some of the history of type, typography. We've gone through the anatomy of a font. Let's get back to business for just a little bit. Sure. Let's talk about fonts in the workplace because that's what it's all about ultimately. Yeah. So, you know, if you think about fonts, you know, uh, a common request that we get as a ticket here at Valiant is can you install the corporate fonts on a machine or it's part of our new user, new employee setup, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is part of a corporate identity to have a consistent font both for, for let's say, uh, office applications or you're doing graphic design, you know, anything like that. So PowerPoints. Uh, it, it's really important. So, um, but, you know, the question is, where do fonts come from? The font store. Come on. <laughs> They're delivered in like a, a seabird? They, they just kind of come down from the uh, the sky and you catch them and they're exactly. in a little blanket. Um, no, there's there's top font foundries, type foundries. They're, they're businesses that design and distribute typefaces. And right. uh, the reason they're called foundries is because they're a reference to the past where these individual um, dyes were cast in metal. They were done in a foundry. Right, right. And, you know, and, and one thing we see is that managing these fonts are, is complicated. So we're just going to briefly blow past this one, but I think this is, this is almost into the uh, second episode uh, or third episode of our kind of like typography communication. So um, there's a bunch of different tools you would utilize. And I, and actually, I don't even know if I want to go too deep into it because there's tools, there's licensing. Um, there's, and I, there's, yeah. there's tools, there's licensing, there's penalties. If you're uh, working on a project with an unlicensed typeface, which can be a big problem if you're working with customers that have their own branding, then they need to supply those items to you. They need to be properly tracked Correct. and managed. Um, quite frankly, I would treat them with the same level of sensitivity as personal information, just for the sake of knowing they're being covered. I think Correct. That, and, and, I would. You can get yourself in very deep financial trouble by, especially if you're a marketing communication agency, you use the wrong font or you know, send a large print job, or I, I know, I mean, uh, many a time, uh, have you ever seen a badly displayed, uh, you know, billboard with the wrong font? You know, it can happen. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think uh, we'll talk about that in another episode. But this know there's some really great tools out there. There's ways to manage fonts and um, installing font. And, and I think we'll make it a little bit interactive about how to manage and install fonts, that sort of thing. So we'll have some fun with it. We um, look. I, I worked at a magazine for many years and and ran a lot of these different tools that we'll talk about soon. So. I mean, I, I'll explain how going from not having a tool and managing 85 workstations for magazine production and then having it in place was was something that honestly saved me four or five hours a week because yeah. of how, how much work had to be done. Exactly. So uh, yeah. 25 by hand is very time consuming and it's it's not as straightforward as you would assume it would be. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, so, we'll hold on to some of this for another day because I think that that would itself would be an awesome episode. Yeah, it's very instructive. I think it's one that is under spoken about, um, and especially in the IT field. It's kind of one that really intersects into maybe uh, it's because management we're, and communication. Maybe it's because we're outsiders and the whole typography thing is more of a fight club. You know, you don't talk about, about it. Yeah, you don't talk about typography. That's <laughs> cool. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, we're going to talk about it. And they're going to have to deal with it. But next week, we're going to do typography for the web because that gives me a chance to jump into another medium that I love working in and doing, again, a practical demo to explain what all these things like kerning actually mean. 
and exactly. some of the ways to approach them. So that'll be cool. But um, yeah, you know, it's it's five to eleven. So let's just uh, let's get a bit of a George's final word in, and then yeah. we'll, we'll get ready next week. Exactly. So I, I mean, honestly, this is is a, is a super fascinating topic, and it's great to take a little break from uh, cybersecurity. I love cybersecurity. You know, huge practitioner, advocate, passionate about it, but. I think there's so much more to the things that need to get done or talked about or discussed for customers and for business in general. And typography is a huge part of what we do for our customers and managing for them and working with them to kind of make sure that it's done in a way that they're not going to get banged up on a on on a, a, a un, unfair use license or uh, data management. So I think it's really just a, a great topic to kind of spend some time on, um, but I think it's under under discussed. And um, I learned a lot today, Matt. I didn't know about the shoulder. That was my kind of my new new. So when it was in that parts of the anatomy of the font, I was like, really, I was like, this is super fascinating. Um, I, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> I'm just happy they have good parts like arms and stuff. And it wasn't like this is the kneecap of the letter U because that yeah. would have been kind of strange. Um, yeah, it's it's fun. It's something I honestly haven't delved into much for for a number of years. It was something that I was much much more into. Um, in the past from a, a hobby standpoint. It works in the workplace, but not to the same degree. So uh, between now and next week, it's going to be a lot of excitement as I put something really good together. Cool. For I, can't wait, I can't wait to do it with you. And that's going to be a really cool episode about uh, typography in the web. So please join us next week. Uh, it's going to be a really great topic. We're going to keep the, kind of going through our typography and the kind of like visual communication series. Uh, we have some really great information on it. And um, yeah, please, please, please like and subscribe. Check us out on YouTube. I don't know why I, this didn't occur to me now, but I got a book on my desk that's related to um, the development of certain parts of society, uh, language, buildings, the whole deal. And the cover really kind of succinctly describes what we just talked about. So let's get that up for a second. <laughs> that's really cool. I, I, that's it right there. It's giving form to something that was not tangible. And now that we have form, it's something that can continue and endure <laughs> through the ages. Exactly. That's really exactly. what it was about today. So cool. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone. Have a great week. Stay safe. And I can't wait to see you all next Thursday to kind of go through fonts and the web. All right. Same valiant time, same valiant Bye channel, now. kids. <laughs> Have a good Bye. one, folks.